All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Samuels. I'm the director of Sake and Spirits for Vine Connections. I'm very honored to be joined by... She has uh, founded an Oyster Master Guild, and she does all kinds of really awesome things that we're going to explore today. Um, Julie and I met many, many years ago, and um, this oyster and sake magic is something that we have been... Um, we've been promoting for a long time. So really excited to share it with you. Um, just to talk a little bit about Julie, if we can go to the next slide. So Julie, as I was saying, and feel free to interject at any, any point here, Julie um, has a really strong background in marketing and advertising, and she works in sustainable seafood and her passion for oysters has led her to founding her own blog, working with oyster farmers around the world, judging oyster competitions around the world. Um, the oyster journal that you see here is a really great tool that she's come up with. You know, tasting oysters and tasting sake, both of them, the more that you taste, the better your palate will be calibrated to detecting the nuances. And it is really important to take notes. Um, you always think you're gonna remember how something impacts your palate. And then after a few drinks and a few dozen oysters, it's all a blur. So um, this is a really great way to evaluate what's happening in your mouth. And Julie is, um, after meeting her and eating oysters with Julie, she changed my mind about a lot of things. I like to think that I'm a purist about most things, but I've always been a person who used lemon and mignonette on my oysters. And Julie kind of forced my hand and made me try them naked and really respect how much work goes into cultivating and harvesting these. So uh, Julie, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it's so good to be here. Um, yeah, and thank you. So Julie has sourced five different oysters uh, from the East and West Coast that we're gonna taste tonight. And uh, we're gonna start with oysters and then we'll dive a little deeper into sake and we'll talk about what happens between the two. So I wanted to, uh, Julie and I put out a beginner's guide to pairing sake and oysters a little while back. And um, part of the reason that, that this pairing makes so much sense, you know, in, in Japan, I talked to sake brewers who were like, well, obviously sake and oysters, why would you pair wine with oysters? It just, it overwhelms the oyster. And it's so funny because no one really talks like that in the US. And if we think about classic oyster pairings. It's so based on these like high acid sparkling wines and white wines that are very nice with oysters, but they can kind of wash away all that delicate nuance and subtlety that we're about to learn about today. And it, um, you know, it, at its worst, there's a quality in, uh, in wine that can enhance the bitterness and the metallic qualities in oysters. So um, it either kind of washes away the oyster or it can create an unpleasant aftertaste in your mouth. And Jen just reminded me um, of some housekeeping issue, uh, housekeeping notes. So um, please feel free to pop in any questions or comments in the chat or the Q&A. Just as a note, I'll probably be paying more attention to the Q&A. I do have some questions that people have submitted for Julie already. Um, if you have anything else that you'd like to be answered live, please make sure to pop it in the Q&A. The chat is great too. If you're like, oh my God, I love this sake. It's so good with these oysters. Or I live in this part of the country. I'd like to get some of these oysters or these sakes. We'll be paying attention to both. Um, and also the chat, if you are having any problems, if you can't see our faces on the screen, there's something strange about your uh, the resolution that you're looking at, please pop it in the chat and we will address that. Um, so yeah, sake and oysters, the, so sake doesn't have this really overwhelming acidity that masks a lot of the delicate qualities of the oyster, but um, what Julie and I talk a lot about when we talk about this pairing is umami. Um, and I know that umami is kind of a trendy concept now because it's this elusive fifth taste. You know, there's sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and then umami, which can really increase the depth and complexity of flavor and what you're eating. And, Chefs love to work with it because if you have dishes with umami, you don't need to use so much salt to, to satisfy your need for flavor. And so there's a lot of umami in hard aged cheeses, in dried mushrooms, in dry aged meats. 
And oysters have a ton of umami. Um, part of the makeup of umami are different acids and oysters are very high in both glutamic acids and inosinic acids. And there is something that people talk a lot about when they talk about food science and umami, which is umami synergy, which theoretically means that if you combine two things that both have umami, it becomes explosive and just like takes that sensation of complexity of flavor and depth of flavor to this exponential level. And that's why, you know, sun-dried tomatoes with Parmesan cheese can be just like this crazy savory experience or, you know, an anchovy uh, Caesar salad with anchovies and Parmesan cheese can be just so incredibly delicious. And so that happens with beverage as well. Sake is a lot higher in, in these umami acids than most other alcoholic beverages. So when you combine the two, you really do enhance the experience of both the sake and the oyster. Um, so we are going to have a lot of fun with this today. Um, as we get started, I, I know that I've been cooking a lot at home and I assume that you guys have too because of the current situation that we're in. And I think we all have a comfort level that in our own kitchens. And I know that I've started to work outside of mine as much as possible, but there's certain things that I just don't even think about doing at home, like making sushi. And I know a lot of people, for, for them, that experience is having kind of an oyster bar experience at home. You know, it's so, it's so intimidating to know where to buy them, how to open them, how to store them. Um, so I thought we'd start with a shucking demo from Julie, if that's okay with you. So um, I just want to show you guys why a shucking demo is necessary if you want to talk about shucking quality. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I am a huge proponent of learning. Well, learning how to shuck is a, a huge door opener. I think if you are looking for the best and freshest, most intimate oyster experiences you can possibly get, there's no better oyster bar than your kitchen if you know how to shuck. And then also understanding that there's a difference between a good shuck and a bad shuck is really important because when you're enjoying an oyster, um, the texture is a huge part of that experience. So you really don't want to, you know, start spitting out pieces of shell or grit or, you know, kind of having the texture ruined for you before you actually enjoy that oyster. So for me, you know, learning how to shuck is, was what I will be showing you in the kitchen in a few minutes, but then understanding like there is a huge um, kind of skill gap between knowing how to shuck and then shucking really well. And I would say that if you go to an oyster bar, once we can all go to oyster bars again, uh, finding people who know how to shuck is shuck well is a really good sign that they they know what they're doing and they really respect the product that they're working with. So should I, I mean, should I just jump over to the kitchen? Yeah, well, just looking at this picture for a second, um, I think it's probably pretty evident to everyone what a good and bad shuck looks like. And it took me a while and I was like posting pictures on social media of having a dozen oysters <laughs> right. and really would, would be like, listen, those are, those look right. terrible. <laughs> Don't post them. <laughs> There's yeah, all right. it's like, it's so second nature to me that I forgot <laughs> to even describe like one, one is obviously very scrambled, very cut open. And the others are as if like you lifted the top shell of the oyster and there was no knife involved in the matter, right? Um, and understandably, like in restaurants, it's really hard to keep that quality level, especially when you're having to shuck like happy hour oysters in a hot minute. Um, but when you have the time, it's definitely worth doing. Yeah, and there's an Instagram account that shames people for bad shucks. And right. so, like, for me, I feel like it's a victory just to get this thing open. Um, but to have to worry about preserving the oyster body in this immaculate shape. So I'm very excited about watching you shuck an oyster. Um, <laughs> I think we're cool. going to go All right, well, let me mosey on over there. Okay. Welcome to my kitchen. So my husband's gonna be helping me sort of hold this in place here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So I have 
you know, already some free shift oysters later, but these are the five varieties that we're gonna have. And Sorry, Julie, a, uh, Julie, I actually can't hear you. Everybody's looking for a place to buy oysters to enjoy at home. I have a Wait. website, um, I have a page on the website that is a database of all the farmers in the U.S. that are shipping to the consumers. Julie, we actually can't hear you. So, okay, we just have a shop. You'll find that database. And it's the best time is the growers right now because most oysters are obviously sold to restaurants and most farmers um, don't really have that channel anymore. So, they're really relying upon consumers to Julie, we actually can't hear you. oysters cup side down in the fridge um, open like this do not actually enclose them do not suffocate them don't put any ice you don't need ice you don't need fresh water fresh water actually kills the oyster so as long as you keep them in a container like this uh, generally east coast oysters can last up to two weeks super fresh in the fridge and then the west coast are a little bit more delicate so i would say consume them raw within like seven days but in this case, um, so what I'm going to show you is some equipment. This is my Game of Thrones Michael Jackson glove that my husband got me for Christmas a while ago. It's not necessary for shucking oysters. In fact, you can just use like a, a kitchen towel to hold the oyster. What it does is it, it really does help protect my hand. And if you expect to shuck maybe a, a couple hundred in your lifetime, this is definitely worth investing in. Another thing is an oyster knife. So this one I'm actually just toying with today. It's a French brand um, from Opinel, and, but this is usually my go-to. And oyster knives are very important. Do not use a clam knife. Don't use a butter knife. In a really big emergency, you can try and use a screwdriver, but that's like literally an emergency and you really want oysters and there's nothing else to do. <laughs> so oyster knives, um, they should have a very sturdy blade pointed at the top. I would. I would recommend a pointier top than a blunter. It, it'll make going into the oyster easier. Okay, so what you wanna do um, is grab your unopened oyster, bit of anatomy. So I think what I have here is the ROC Reserve, which is a Virginica oyster, and that is native to the, the North American Atlantic coast. Um, all, all Virginica oysters are similar in that they have this really signature teardrop shape. Whereas like a Pacific oyster has more of a oblong egg shape like this and a lot frillier. And this one has a ton of barnacles on it. But um, there you see that there's going to be a flat side to the oyster and a cup side. So oysters are bivalves and they have asymmetrical shells. So the top shell is usually like this flat piece. It should be easier to tell. Um, also I have here is just a oyster shucking board, but you can use a cutting board as well. That's what I usually use, but this contains the mess. And you want to hold the oyster on the cup side down. If you are right-handed like myself, you obviously use uh, put the knife in your right hand. And what you want to do is actually enter the oyster through this really small part called the hinge. This is where the two shells meet together, but it's almost like a secret door to a club. You kind of need to find it um, and start shimmying your blade right into that point. Now this is the part where I think it's easy for newbies to try really hard to get in there but the trick is actually to use a lot of controlled force so that you don't jam the knife blade into the oyster um, thus maybe risking kind of you know injuring your hand. Another tip is you want to point this blade slightly down so you never are actually pointing into your, your, your palm. Oyster shucking is a little counterintuitive this way. You're always taught like not to point knives into your hands, but in this case, you kind of do. So you just want to manage that force. And, and when you go in here, you just, all you need to do is just like shimmy the blade a little bit, like so. 
and using gradual force, you shimmy it in where if you lift the oyster, is that good? Yeah. If you lift the oyster, it's not going to move. If you feel like the oyster is still wobbly all over the place, it means you haven't gone in far, th far enough to kind of leverage that shell open. And but once you get to this point, all you need to do is actually torque the knife like as if you were turning a set of car keys. So like this, it's really small, but you'll feel this really satisfying pop or click. And the two shells are kind of separated in that way. So once you get to this point, um, when the hinge is facing you, there is that adductor muscle that is holding the top and bottom shell together on the right side. It's always on the right side. So when the hinge is pointing to you, always on the right side, what you want to do is take your knife blade and scrape it across the bottom of the top shell. So you like you miss the oyster meat altogether and you want to sever that meat, that adductor muscle at the top. So in my case, I like to just kind of hold the oyster in place, kind of pry open the, the hinge with my thumb and scrape to knife through. And voila. So that is the top shell removed. You see, uh, if you are very skilled, and sometimes I can do this, sometimes I can't, um, there's no remaining muscle on the top shell right there. All you see is this little, little black dot. And at this point, the oyster is still in the cup side. You want to just take your knife and remove any of the leftover shell bits around so you're not going to eat them. Um, there's usually a little bit of shell grit in the bottom edge, and you just want to kind of take the knife blade and scrape that out. If you're just at home, I usually just use my thumb, and that's fine. And then to remove the, or sever the oyster from the shell, you just take your knife blade and scrape the bottom adductor like so. So that way it's loose. And I try and be super careful as to not like twist and turn the meat. I just make sure that it is laid down there perfectly. And there you have it. So you can kind of remove that natural suction and you have an oyster ready to enjoy. And I will just show you really quickly, I suppose, a Pacific one, which is very similar in that there is a hinge. Uh, let me know if this is this knife. Like this. The top is off. You get rid of this grit. This one has a bit more meat and less liquor. Oh, another thing is you try to retain the liquor if there is a lot in there. In the oyster, if there's a, there's, if it's just swimming in ocean water, um, you can probably pour a little bit out. So that is a Pacific oyster shot. And yeah. I will, I will head back to the other table with these oysters so we can continue to enjoy them. <laughs> that was so awesome. Um, I am so intimidated by what you just did, um, especially on camera. And I, I agree, it's very counterintuitive to point a sharp object directly at your hand. Um, and you just made that look so easy. I. Uh, I like knowing that the adductor muscle is always on the right and that there's a secret door. Um, so Julie, what I wanted to, if you guys are super inspired and interested to learn more about oyster aquaculture, um, Julie has a really great YouTube show called Around the World and 80 Oysters. Um, you know, right now, since we can't travel, she has contacted a lot of friends who are oyster farmers from around the world and, um, these are really amazing opportunities to understand why that sense of place is so important when you're picking oysters and how it really influences the oyster. We talk about terroir all the time in wine, and I think it's indisput indisputable that where the grapes are grown are really going to influence the, uh, the characteristics of the wine. But with oysters, I feel like in America, we're like, well, West Coast and East Coast, right? And you just kind of generalize what everything on the West Coast tastes like versus the East Coast. So we're going to taste five oysters and um, Julie's going to talk a little bit about the regionality and the farming involved. But um, if you guys are curious to learn more and if you're surprised that there are, that Mexico is known for oysters or that Thailand is known for oysters, it's pretty eye-opening. So I think we're going to get started with the first oyster, which is the one that you opened first for us, right? The ROC? 
Yes, so Rock Reserves, ROC stands for Real Oyster Cult. And Real Oyster Cult is this really fun website and app where you can order a bunch of different varieties of oysters shipped to your door. So um, the, the farmers and the owners of this company, Rob and Sims, have been doing this for years. So they were actually doing direct-to-consumer oysters pre-COVID. And the oyster that they're growing is where they are from, which is Duxbury, Massachusetts. If anybody's had an Island Creek oyster, that is also where they are grown. Um, there's actually quite a, a lot of oyster farmers in this bay and they all have sort of their own little plots and own, own way of doing things. So ROC Reserves is a Atlantic native oyster. Um, I put up the method of cultivation. There's so many kinds of uh, styles of cultivation that oysters take on, but what they do for the reserves is that they actually let this oyster grow for one more year, one more winter, on the Duxbury Bay floor. And because it takes a little bit more time, the shells are super sturdy, they're really easy to shuck, which is why I started with that one. And they have a little bit more complexity than your typical one and a half year old, two year old oyster. So yeah, I guess, are we going for it? Yeah. I really love Duxbury because they are consistently just my level of perfect brininess and this very nice bright kind of almost fruity quality to the oyster. It's very clean. There's a little bit of minerality, but it feels like you are just swimming in pristine ocean water, which is essentially what is collecting in Duxbury. How do you feel? Yeah, it has, um, the salinity is a lot more complex than just brine. You know, there's a, there's almost like a smokiness to it, along with that clean salt water that I, I really like. Um, kind of like a cucumber pickle note to it too. Yeah, I can definitely say that. Pickle, yes, for sure, pickles. Awesome. awesome. What's next? So, so the next one is also a Virginica oyster, the East Coast oyster from Katama Bay, which is um, on the Eastern side of Martha's Vineyard. And these are grown by Brian Smith from his company is called Signature Oyster. There's also quite a few oyster growers in Katama Bay, but this happens to be, uh, you know, the one that real oyster cult carries. So these are grown a little bit differently. They are grown in off-bottom rack and bag. And that means that the oysters are essentially suspended off of the seafloor for all of their lives. Salinity is actually a bit more so than Duxbury at times. Right now, I feel like they are pretty comparable. Um, they don't get as much of, um, I feel like their bay is a bit more protected. So the flavors that concentrate into this oyster is a bit stronger. Like it's not, it has just a little bit more funkiness, I, in my opinion, like a little bit of bamboo, if you will. I don't know, like canned bamboo, just a bit more of a personality. So what does the off-bottom racking do to the oysters generally? Does it make the uh, shells deeper or? Yeah, that's a good question. So every oyster farm is different in that they just have to adapt to their environment. Off-bottom rack and bag usually will allow the grower to kind of protect their crop from predators that keep going on the sea floor. So in Duxbury, there's actually not a lot of predators. So I've heard in Duxbury, but at the same time, if you're broadcasting your oysters on the sea floor, it's really survival of the fittest and only the fittest and most delicious oysters will survive and, and get to your plate. Whereas the off bottom culture, it's a bit more reliable as a producer to contain your products in, you know, in either like metal cages or I've seen plastic ones um, the downside to it, though, is that actually because the oyster doesn't necessarily have to uh, toughen up to fight off certain things, the shells can be a little bit brittle if they're not tumbled a, a bit. Um, so there's trade-offs. I noticed that these shells were the only ones that kept breaking. Um, so that's good to know. This is super savory compared to the first one. It, it almost has like a like an iodine ocean umami, you know? Yes. Like a dashi characteristic. Uh, we have a question. Does off-bottom racking usually have less grit? Um, I would say from, uh, from eating, like, 
So the grit that ends up inside the oyster is really the result of shucking and the grit falling inside the oyster. Oysters aren't the same as clams in that they don't actually have grit. They, like, they don't need to be, um, what do you call it, uh, purged after they're harvested. Oysters are free from that. In fact, if any grit lasts in the oyster, that's what a pearl is essentially. <laughs> but when you, you know, there's oysters that are grown on the bottom that do have a little bit of mud and whatever on the outside. So most growers will power wash their oysters before they bring it to market. But I wouldn't say that the equipment necessarily contributes to how gritty and messy the oyster is on the outside or the inside, sorry. <laughs> So should okay. we move on? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So the, the third one is we're choosing the Eld Inlet. So now we're going to the Pacific Coast. And the next three oysters were sent over by our friends at Hama Hama, which is a fabulous oyster farm on Kud Canal. If you ever have the opportunity to go out to Seattle, I would highly recommend taking like the one and a half, maybe two hour or two and a half drive uh, over the... Um, kind of like the, the peninsula and then down to Hood Canal where they have a really lovely oyster bar along their oyster farm. And they have, you know, they grow their own oysters and then they also source oysters from elsewhere. So the Eld Inlet is an oyster that they source from Ian Child of South Shel Sound Sel Shellfish. And Eld Inlet is one of the five inlets that is a part of South Puget Sound. And oysters, if you guys aren't where they really thrive in locations where fresh water meets ocean water. So they really like a level of brackish water because that's where the nutrients, is, um, nutrients are. And Elb happens to be a place where nutrients actually accumulates, it stays there. So for me, the Elds have this very quintessential South Puget Sound taste. It's like, I don't know, it's, it, to me, it feels like if you just pumped an oyster full of plankton, <laughs> that's what it tastes like. You are what you eat, in a sense. Sometimes I actually find elds to be less salty. It just depends on how much rainfall there is, um, you know, right before they harvest. But these, to me, are on the, on the brinier side right now. It's so creamy. Um, yeah. I mean, I notice that a lot of Washington oysters that I've had are really creamy. Is that, is that kind of always the case year round? Not necessarily year round. Um, this is about the time when they do start to get creamy. The Pacific oyster will start to develop gametes and that's sort of what you're eating uh, when the summer months hit. And some oysters that, you know, they really develop this creaminess in preparation to spawn. Um, these on, haven't actually converted or are ready to do that just yet, but that is really what you're tasting. And this happens a lot more in Pacific oysters than in Atlantic. So I've definitely tasted oyster, like Pacific oysters that um, have a soft, but more like custardy um, or panna cotta-like texture versus a, a very milky or like triple creme melty triple creme texture. Um, and then we have another question. So does bag on the beach mean that they're grown at a more shallow depth? Um, yes, compared to certain off bottom uh, rack and bag, it can. Uh, sorry, the I forgot to mention that the bag on beach is very classic for Pacific Northwest oysters, what they, what, what is done is that they live out juvenile months in a bag that is more protected from predators, and then they are actually broadcasted uh, outside on the ground. So similar to real uh, ROC reserves in that way. But that is why I think if you notice like, Monica, the shells of the Eld inlets, you'll see that it starts off pretty smooth and then it starts to get frilly. And mm -hmm. that is really a, a key signature bag on beach method. Because the frilly the, yeah. So, you know, the frills, the end frills will only really exist when the oysters aren't disturbed or tumbled at the end of the finishing cycle. They're beautiful. 
yeah, they're, they're really cool. At the end of all oyster outings, I really like to flip the shells over on my plate, which is like the final component of tasting to really understand and admire the different shells that come about. It's really cool. It's like a labor of love for them. Totally. Okay, next one. Yes. Okay, so then we are going to uh, a bit more north at the northern end of the Olympic Peninsula. This is called the Summer Stone. And this is actually grown by the Hamahama Company. And Summer Stone is a summertime oyster. You actually can't get them at any other times of the year. What, they're, uh, what they do is they're actually growing this oyster, similar method to the Eld, but in deeper, cooler water um, in, in this area that's by Skunk Island, which is, I think, which was the original name, Skunk Island Oysters. But I was like, dude, that's not a marketable name. <laughs> So I think that's maybe they changed this to Summer Stone a little bit later. Um, but, you know, they are kind of, they enjoy sort of this upwelling of nutrient-rich ocean water at the same time being very protected. I think these are also very quintessential Pacific oysters in that there is a huge amount of creaminess to them. And I feel like they have a lot of umami right now. Um, and, you know, they're just... I'm very curious to see how this oyster actually pairs to some of the sakes because to yeah, me this I, says a lot of umami. I feel like um, I've had a lot of hamahama oysters and I don't normally describe them as having umami so I'm looking forward to tasting this. Um, I had a quick question about the spec under Meroir, the salinity 26, 29, is that parts per ton? Or? Parts per thousand, yes. So um, o full ocean salinity is 35 parts per thousand. Oysters can typically survive anywhere between five to almost beyond ocean salinity to 40 parts per thousand. Um, and, and the salinity is a huge part of Meroir. So for the West Coast oysters, uh, there is an approximation of salinity because there's such actually quite a bit more freshwater influx um, at any given time. But yeah, the, the salinity, I think the water flow, which is where the tides and kind of sources of water come in, and also what makes up the, the sea bottom, really all contribute to the, the meroir. What do you think? Um, it is taking all of my self-control not to reach for a glass of sake right now because I know we're doing <laughs> that next. Um, but I, I agree there, you feel those, the inosinic acid, I think, a lot more in this oyster and it kind of makes you want a drink like this is the oy oyster that's made me the most thirsty out of out of all of them if that makes sense yes i definitely know what you mean um, so we should we have a question here yeah. does the salinity of the oysters affect the sturdiness of the shells hmm that's an interesting question i I don't know, to be honest. Um, I'm just trying to think of examples across the country. And the sturdiness of the shell, in my mind, typically relates to how fast growing the oyster is, which that is a combination of how warm the water is and how much food is in the water. Um, Solidity, I think, can play a role in the level of predators that are that is in the water. So whether or not more salinity means more predators or less salinity, less predators depends on where you are because different <laughs> predators like different salinities. But generally, I, I actually don't, I don't associate the two to be direct, uh, directly correlated with each other. Um, it is, yeah, um, the amount of time, temperature, how fast they're growing, and, and how, how much they're handled, really. Like, the farmers can decide to tumble the oysters nonstop, which is essentially like working out the oyster nonstop, building its muscles and building the sturdiness of the shell. And that would probably make a bigger impact on the shell strength. That makes sense. Um, all right. Do we have one more? Okay, yeah. So the final one is uh, one that I, I have a lot of heart for because I've met 
these two growers who are our age and husband and wife duo with a small baby at the time when I visited. And um, they are called Fjord Lux. They're grown just above Hama Hama on the north end of Hood Canal. And they are also Pacific oysters. They're using intertidal flip bags. So it's, um, they, the, the equipment that they're using is similar to the off bottom bags, but instead of having structures to hold them off the seafloor, it's more just like they're sitting there on a line and potentially kind of connected to a float to flip them back and forth with the tide. And oh, Alice and Van are, hmm? I've actually seen that. It's super cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a great new technique that has been adopted uh, or invented in the Pacific Northwest, I believe, and adopted sort of nationwide, if not elsewhere in the world. Um, so that's about this one is that, well, the, you know, a lot like oyster farmers are really the, I guess the advocates and champions of clean environments because you have to have a clean environment in order to have a great oyster. And so what they're doing is donating part of their oyster proceeds to uh, restoration efforts in the Pacific Northwest area. That's amazing. I also really love their shells. Like, that's, it's so pretty. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen those stripes before. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's genetic, a genetic line specifically, but a lot of Pacific oysters tend to have, um, this really vibrant coloring to them. It's very cool. We have a question here. What factors impact the size of the oyster and what makes them large or small? Oh yes, good question. So each different species will have its growth rate and I think probably like the max size it can get. So everybody should know that you can get base, uh, five different species of oyster in North America and the ones that are native to our Atlantic coast, the Virginicas are, I think the, the factor of size is again about age and water temperature, how fast it grows and how long it's able to grow. And um, when you go to like a, an oyster bar, it's kind of funny because it's a little deceptive. Like on the, on the East coast in say New York, you would think that all Pacific oysters are tiny but it's not actually the fact, it's only because they're really hard to ship or they're really expensive to ship. So we only see the extra small oysters. Like this, for example, is what they consider to be an extra small oyster, which is actually the size of a regular oyster on the Atlantic coast. Um, the other, exactly you know, thought, huh? I, That's exactly what I thought. I always thought that Kumamoto, Shigoku, all these famous West Coast oysters were just inherently tiny. Yeah, well, the Kumamoto is different. I should say that. The Kumamoto is a species that is, uh, by default, very small. If you ever get a Kumamoto that is, like, bigger than one and a half, two inches wide or long, not really a true Kumamoto, <laughs> just FYI. You never find big Kumamotos. Um, and also Olympia oysters, which are native to the Pacific coast, they're also very tiny, about, like, a, a half dollar at most but they pack a punch, so don't under underestimate them, I suppose. So now that I have a little bit of context, um, the ROC definitely were low umami to me. Um, like the, I could definitely see how much more fruity and cucumbery the ROC was. I feel like the Katama was the most umami and savory. And then um, the Summer Stones, Wait, no. Yeah, the summer stones yeah. are probably next after that. So I'm excited to start tasting. Yeah. Um, so we thought what we'd do today, and obviously I know you guys don't have these five oysters in, in front of us, in, in front of you, so we're not gonna make you suffer too much uh, watching us have this delicious experience. But I wanted to talk about each sake and then kind of Julie and I will both take a different approach to pairing this with an oyster to show you what happens and also to show you that you really can't go wrong. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I, I don't, I think that as hard as we try, we will not be able to find a terrible pairing here. 
And um, it really speaks to that magic of the umami. And, and I think that it really um, highlights the characteristic of the oyster. We have a question about West Coast oysters. Are they derived from Portuguese oysters? No, I believe they're not the same species. So the Portuguese is the, I think they share the same, sorry, the same family, uh, Chrysostria, but then the Portuguese is Angulata and the Pacific's are Gigas. And I don't think that they are necessarily connected until like way, way back in the day. Um, one funny relation is actually the Chilean oyster is the same as a New Zealand oyster. Really? Which is cool. Yeah, because that was when those land masses were together and that oyster decided to kind of part ways, but you can still find the same species on, on opposite ends of the world. I think the Portuguese oyster, um, yeah, I don't, I don't find any similarities between that oyster and the aesthetics and the, the flavor profile to the Pacific. If anything, it's like, it's more like the European native. Hmm. Um, all right, so the first sake, we're gonna taste four sakes. The first one is the Takatenjin, Sword of the Sun. This is um, one of my go-to summertime drinks. It's a tokubetsu hanjozo. This is a style that I think is kind of highly misunderstood in the world of sake because people hear that it has a little bit of added alcohol and they assume that it's gonna be boozy or um, just really harsh or aggressive. And actually it's very counterintuitive, just like pointing the tip of the oyster knife towards your hand. Um, adding that little bit of alcohol and premium sake makes, a re makes for a really lifted sake, makes for a very linear sake that has very bright aromatics and is very clean on the finish. And it's one of the reasons that I drink this a lot in the summer. It's just a super crushable porch pounder style of sake. Um, I think it's a really great gin drinker sake because of these green herbs and botanicals. And I get a lot of cucumber, green melon, um, this is from a region in Japan that this is a part of Shizuoka where Mount Fuji is. It's the sunniest part of the country year round. So they're actually able to be a solar powered brewery and they get all their energy from solar panels, which is why we call this sake the sword of the sun. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say bright, clean cucumber, grassy melon. Where are you, where are you thinking of going with this one, Julie? I think I'm going to try this with actually the ROC Reserve because I remember detecting a bit of like the cucumbery note, even though it's an Atlantic oyster and I usually don't taste something like that, but like the pickled cucumber um, idea, I'm curious to try it with this one. Let's do it. And the other thing I was going to say is um, I like to do this where you try the oyster with the sake, and then afterwards you pour a little sake in the shell of the oyster and chase it, because I think it's a really different way of experiencing the sake. Mm -hmm. You can either pour it right on top of the oyster, but I don't have a lot of room in my shell, so I'm gonna try this, have a sip of sake, and then pour some sake in my shell. And uh, Wait, so you don't sip and then slurp and then sip again? You're just slurping and then sipping? Well, let's see how it goes with this one. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, ruffled potato chips. <laughs> that sounds good too. <laughs> but that's um, a really good comment. So we have a comment in the chat about how a little salt brings out that bright melon and refreshing quality, which I really get, especially when you drink the takatenjin out of the oyster shell. Oh, yeah. That is really interesting. Yeah, that definitely has the, I'm like the edge of my lip, especially. I like that pairing. I, so, I imagine I will not dislike a pairing. <laughs> yeah, well, you can have a lot of fun with sake drinking vessels. Like I generally don't love drinking sake out of a wooden masu box, unless it's a sake that's 
really savory and high acid and or aged like sometimes the wood is really nice and there's um one of my friends gave me these dried squid bodies where like the the actual narrow torso of the squid is like a sake, uh, sake tokuri or carafe. And you pour hot sake in this dried squid body and it's soft. And, and so that squid flavor really like takes, uh, takes over with the sake a little bit. So you want to do it with a more sturdy sake, but then you can grill the dried squid later after it reabsorbs all the liquid from the sake. And it's just this amazing umami snack. So wow. I always like to test the boundaries of drinking sake out of more food like things like oyster shells. Amazing. I think I'm going to go with the Eld's inlet okay. here. Um, I just really liked the creaminess of this oyster. And I, I, I think the sake has a great creaminess as well with the right pairing. So I might do, I might sip, eat, and then, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I feel like your pairing was very much about the flavor of the sake and the flavor of the oyster. And this pairing changed the texture of both. Yeah, that's true. That was really interesting. And in my case, like I noticed that the eld is very quintessential vegetal notes, cucumberish, but the sake made it taste more meaty mm -hmm. in a way, a little bit more savory. It like it it definitely felt like a marriage of the two. Uh, versus like going down parallel paths. Totally. So for the next sake, we're going to have something that is less crushable, but uh, also really good summertime sake. I think if the Takatenjin Sword of the Sun is a great sake for gin drinkers, I would say that the Kawatsuru Crane of Paradise is a great sake for mezcal drinkers. I find that there's a smokiness that kind of reminds me of the smokiness that we got on the summer stones a little mm -hmm. bit and um but it's really really tropical like there's so much pineapple and so like great mezcal has that balance of juicy tropical fruit and smoke um i just think this is a really nice robust style of sake um it's great for barbecue and this is from the island of shikoku it's the eastern island of japan it's no known as the most laid back island of japan and um, it sits on the Seto Inner Island Sea. And there's, a, uh, there's this sand sculpture in the top right hand corner that's near the brewery that I put up here because if you, Japanese people are pretty superstitious. And if you look at this, uh, this Zenigata sand sculpture, it's supposed mm -hmm. to bring you, uh, it's supposed to ensure that you have a very long and very healthy and prosperous life. And I feel like we could all use health and financial security uh, and longevity right now. So. Uh, but it's a beautiful place. And then this is all estate grown rice. You can see the producer standing in his own rice field here. He grows his own Yamara Nishiki, which is thought of as the king of sake rice. Um, yeah, but a little more smoky, a little more full bodied. So am I going, am I taking my pick first? Mm -hmm. um, I think what I want to, do is try this oyster with the katema bay because the way that you described it tastes like it feels more intense and I don't want to see what that's like with a super intense oyster. And maybe I'll do actually a, the pour over. I've definitely done the pouring sake over other shellfish though, and it doesn't necessarily work as well as with oysters. Like for example, scout, like raw scallops. Um, I don't know why that was. Maybe it was not as salty. I think so. And also, well, a little salt. Sake can't go wrong with salt, but also I think it's that inosinic acid umami that where there really is like a chemical thing that mm -hmm. happens in the shell. Mm. 
The sake tastes really fruity in this pairing to me, and the like anise fennel licorice notes of the sake are really pronounced for me in the pairing, mm -hmm. which I like. Yeah, I agree with the, the fruitiness. Um, it tastes very refreshing. Mm -hmm. like, All right, I'm gonna go with the summer stone here, just because I feel like that, I don't know, the, the, I, I got a smokiness, like you described it as bamboo, but I, which I totally get. There's kind of this woody quality to this oyster. Things are flying on my hand, <laughs> shocking me. <laughs> right, summer stone. What's the best way to dispose of oyster shells? Mm. Sorry, hang on. If you have, I mean, they're essentially calcium carbonate, so they can be composted. If you have a garden, awesome thing to do is just crush them up and then put them in your um, you know, vegetable bed or flower bed. And then in New York City, uh, a lot of restaurants actually save up their oyster shells and um, for Billion Oyster Project, which is an oyster reef restoration initiative. Um, Lobster Place will actually go around to many, many different restaurants in the city, or they, they did pre-COVID, to pick up oyster shells every week. Um, yeah, but for, for me, I usually will put them in my compost. And you usually want to bring that compost outside <laughs> the same day. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like in New York, there's such an awareness of how, how restorative oyster shells are for the environment. Um, but, you know, I, I, I see them get thrown away and not properly disposed of all the time. So the garden idea is really good. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, if you actually think about the economic value of any oyster shell, um, like collectively, it's it's quite large, and thousands upon thousands of dollars actually gets thrown, yeah, you know, into the trash because there's just not a really good way of processing them. So before you can actually use it for restoration, they, they have to be cured and cleaned for about a year. Uh, wow. So you need quite a bit of space and a lot of human resources to be able to do that. So I feel like with the summer stones, you have to really want to get funky. Um, you know, I, I feel like it emphasized that like woody smokiness in both the sake and the oyster. It was like, yeah, yeah, getting was, weird. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was really cool, but it was cool. like it definitely needs to be introduced the right way. Where yes, you know, like I think I've had some really interesting caviar preparations that. I feel like so, for so many people, caviar, you think of a bellini pancake and creme fraiche and it's just kind of bright. And I, um, you came to this event that I did at Cosme, this Mexican restaurant where the mm -hmm. caviar was on top of like a corn, like kind of a smoky corn masa dough and it was a really savory preparation. And I like that brine and extra umami. Um, mm -hmm. So I happen to like this pairing, but I feel like the more popular pairing would probably be with the katana. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's go to the next sake. Next sake is the Moon on the Water. So this is from a brewery. Uh, My favorite. Uh, well, uh, this brewery is in Akitsu, which is a region in Hiroshima Prefecture. Um, this region has the most oyster beds in Japan. So if you are, if you subscribe to what grows together, goes together, uh, this would be a good place to start. I, this, Brewery also, the location has some of the softest water in Japan. They call this region the birthplace of Ginjo sake. And when we're talking about Ginjo, it's this slow, cold fermentation that really stresses out the yeast so that the aromatics just jump out of the glass. And um, I think, you know, I know, Julie, this is one that you've fallen in love with from an early, from an early point, which people really fall in love with this sake because it's so kind of intoxicating and how perfumed and vibrant and intense it is. And, but then 
it's so soft on the palate because of that really soft water. And you can really kind of taste that super, super precise sake making um, at every step. I always get a lot of pineapple, really intense violet and floral notes, more of that pastis and fennel, cantaloupe. I'm also very partial to a sake because I have been to Hiroshima and seen the oyster production there. And it's just really incredible. So every time I have the sake, it just actually makes me think of being out in the water. And this is this is the sake I will pitch to sake non-believers, like for, for friends or even like psalms who are just like, oh, I don't deal with sake. I give them this and all of a sudden it, it changes their perspective about what sake could be. So it's a good one. And I like the, I like the label. That's the marketing and advertising side of me. <laughs> well, it's, um, this was one of the, this is one of our sake labels where the Japanese name really means moon on the water. And so it was really easy. It's just a direct translation. And I like this sake because it really speaks to this woman's past, present, and future. Like she, even though it's her family business and she's the fifth generation owner of this brewery, she originally went to move to Tokyo and went to school for theater. And when she was like kind of young and romantic, like this moon on the water idea was just so like, yeah, just romantic for her. And now she's just completely entrenched in sake and doing this really geeky stuff and coming up with new innovative ways to make sake all the time. But this is kind of her, like how she fell in love with sake. Yeah. I love it. I think that really echoes the um, entrepreneurial and innovative nature of oyster farmers too. You just kind of have to figure out your own way. So um, for me, I would like to stick with the Pacific side with this oyster, obviously, and would love to try the Fjord Lux with this oyster. I think the last um, time when I had this was like, I actually brought it to Hamahama for their I was there for their oyster rama, which is a really cool event they do in the springtime to open up their oyster beds for people to go out, walk onto the tidal flats and harvest oysters and do tastings. Um, that's, that was, yeah, I, like you, you had sent a case and it was a really good time to show people what oysters and sake could be. That is so good. It really, it's funny, on the initial attack, it kind of erases the umami mm -hmm. at, like, on the oyster, but it has that salinity, the texture. It's the perfect amount of creamy. Like it still has a little bit of a like toothsomeness to it. It's not just this big creamy like explosion in your mouth, but it, it really lifts up, like makes them both feel more vibrant. Mm. Oh yeah, that's a winner. That is a winner. I don't know how I'm going to compete with that one, but <laughs> I think I'm going to go ROC on this one. Okay. What's your, what's your reasoning? Well, it's the most bright and fruity um, after the, after the one that you chose. Um, so, and I'd like to see, I mean, it was so good with the Sword of the Sun, which is also like pretty lifted and bright. And this is just more vibrant, so I think it could be good. Okay. So for these sakes, like what um, temperature are you generally serving these at with the oysters? Do, should they all be chilled? For these ones, I would say, and because it's the end of June and it's really hot outside, I think chilled makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the only, I think that maybe the Kawatsuru, the Queen of Paradise, and the Sacred Power, we could play around with more at room temperature. But I really like matching temperature as a pairing, um, like either doing something really aggressively different, like a, if we if we were having broiled oysters or like an oyster stew or something, I would definitely play around with warming. But I think since mm -hmm. since we're having chilled 
oysters on the half shell that chilled sake makes sense. Yeah. I really like that pairing, actually. I do too. I feel like the pineapple, like it's it's really, it's it like that pep white pepper notes on the sake and the pineapple mm. are really well defined. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think in in this case, like knowing that, I would if you couldn't get your hands on uh, an oyster from Duxbury Bay, I feel like a good substitute would be going up to like Demerara in Maine, Casco Bay. They also the oysters have the same level of high salinity, but this like, mm, like cured meat, meaty, prosciutto-y, fruity, like clean, clean flavor. That's so yummy. for most people, for people at home, do you recommend that people generally buy their oysters online from purveyors like Hamahama or Real Oyster Cult or? If you don't live near an oyster farm that you can drive to to pick up oysters, um, I, I would say I would highly encourage it right now, especially because that that revenue is going directly back to the farm instead of being trickled down through a distributor, uh, it, even if they are selling to consumers. You get the freshest product, like hands down, if you buy from a farm because they're they're essentially taking your order and then they're going out into the water and harvesting. Like yeah. there's no oysters just like sitting around to be shipped. So that's, you know, if you do want the freshest. And I think from a price point, it's actually probably going to be the most reasonable. Um, I don't buy oysters from supermarkets as much as like as convenient as that sounds. I've never really had a good experience with getting high quality artisanal oysters at supermarkets. If you wanted to get like a dozen oysters to shuck and then use in a pan roast, I think that's a perfectly good place to get them. But for raw, you know, this type of kind of curated experience, uh, I would say go direct. And there's several farms who are selling multiple varieties. So you don't have to necessarily just get stuck with a box of a hundred of one kind. Right. How long can you keep oysters for in the fridge? Um, for East Coast, it's probably a good three weeks, if not more, uh, yeah. from the harvest date. So the, the key word is harvest date, right? Like if you get them from a seafood market, they'll tell you, ah, they got in yesterday, but they actually were out of the water a week and a half ago. So you really have to know when the harvest date is. And yeah, if you store them properly, and if they're sturdy, adult, full-grown oysters, they will be just fine. I've, I've tested this with large oysters in my fridge. I just, I actually kind of forgot about them. <laughs> but <laughs> They were in the back of the fridge. I pulled them out, tried a couple, still pretty good. You know, they're not going to be super, like super hydrated, but you can still have them raw is perfectly safe. Um, and if they do dry out, just like pan, pan sear them or like saute them a little bit. The, the West Coast, the species on, on the West Coast is a bit more, um, I guess, I don't know what you call it. It's not as like fragile. They just tend to open up the shells a bit more than the East Coast. So when they do that, they, they dehydrate very quickly and thus they expire a little bit quicker than the East Coast do. So for those, ideally, like within a week, you would consume all of them raw. Okay. I feel like there are probably people listening who are terrified of having a bad oyster who are just like, that sounds like a gamble I'm not <laughs> But I'll try it. Uh, yeah, it, as long as you keep them at temperature. The temperature is critical, right? If anything goes above like a 48 to a 50, I would say that's when you want to cook them. But anything that's kept at a low temperature, even when they're a little bit dehydrated, totally still fine to eat um, because they're not actually growing that like the bacteria or the pathogens that would cause foodborne illness. Awesome. Well, let's talk about the, the last sake and then we'll answer a couple more questions. Yeah. So the last sake is from Kumamoto Prefecture, which always makes me think that these, that oysters and the sake should go well together. And, and the sake has a very ocean umami, like not quite as much as the smokiness that we got on the summer stones, but um, this is a super seaweedy sake for me. Um, this brewery uses, they started out as a rice purveyor before they got into the sake business, which gives them access to some really, really unique ancient heirloom 
grains of rice. And so this is a rice called Kumamoto Shimiki that almost became extinct several times. Um, there's so little of it grown that the Japan Agricultural Consortium didn't even want to bother flying someone all the way down to the island of Kyushu to go inspect this rice. So they were like, do you really need to keep growing this rice? Can't you just grow something else? And so their commitment to this heirloom grain, I think, is, is really inspiring. And, and the reason for it is it, it has this very distinct characteristic. It has this like kombu seaweed um, smokiness and herbaceousness, but it's really pretty and elegant as well. Like I think, I think it's quite floral, really creamy. So as we're tasting and thinking about this, we have a couple questions. One is, uh, what's your favorite way to eat cooked oysters? Is that to you or to me? To me. Well, you're the expert. I, I think it's to you. Oh, goodness. Um, cooked oysters. I like them pretty simply, to be honest. I think I, I like just shucking them and then maybe sauteing them with a little bit of butter, a little bit of lemon juice or like actually lemon zest, not even lemon juice, and then topping off with a little chai. So it's just, you still get the essence of the oyster. Uh, you know, Rockefeller and barbecued oysters certainly have their place. I personally just, I, I can't, I, I would rather be served those things rather than cook them. But there's nothing quite like the Chipotle barbecue or like Chipotle bourbon barbecued oysters that you can get at Hog Island out, uh, in Tamales Bay and there's this these like wonderful little oyster dishes at restaurants like um the oyster the smoked oyster saltine at the ordinary down in Charleston is really good and oh also like low country oyster roast just like steaming a bunch of oysters in burlap sacks and then shucking them like popping them open with a screwdriver with a bunch of people on a cold like fall day that's really special that's a really cool experience um but for me like at home i actually don't eat a ton of cooked oysters because i mostly eat them raw but uh you know I like with um like marinate oil cured oysters or tinned oysters oh yeah well yes so, so thanks to monica i am completely spoiled <laughs> by having amazingly smoked preserved oysters from Hiroshima, like this one particular brand, Oyster Kitchen. I'm obsessed. So smoked oysters, when done right, is incredible. And I really wanted that, um, you know, Hama Hama was actually experimenting with doing their own smoked canned oysters. They're just doing a test run, so I don't have any to share right now, but I feel like that could be also a really good sake pairing. Yeah, I think there's, it's so, it's so luxurious, the texture mm -hmm. of a smoked oil marinated oyster. It's just, it feels like the most decadent thing that you could spread on a piece of toast or cracker. I yeah. really Yeah. You I know, like one, one thing, uh, sorry, one thing after doing a couple interviews uh, for Around the World Navy Oysters is I really want to try more oyster omelets. I think Ooh. that's a very signature Asian, like especially in Southeast Asia, dish. Like every country sort of has their own version, but you just have a bunch of oysters and omelets and it sounds amazing. Yeah, for sure. I love butter and oysters. I mean, it, I think it's a similar, I love butter and soy sauce that like butter and salty umami together is just insane. Um, so I really like doing like a compound butter, like a garlic butter on top of oysters and boiling them. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that when you can't even see the oyster because there's so much stuff on top of it, it's hard to get excited. But like, right. I like, I, butter is always going to be welcome in my kitchen. Right. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, what do you think about pairing with the sake? Oh, okay. So, um, I mean, I'm just looking at the matrix of what we have done and I kind of want to try the summer stone with this sake. All right, let's do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there actually any people who are watching who are actually having oysters while we're doing this? Or is it just potato chips? I know at least two. Okay, awesome. What kind of oysters 
are you having if you are actually having oysters? I'm curious. Well, Jason's drinking Monetary Vision, which is so creamy. Like it kind of, Monetary Vision, I feel like it's kind of like, it's the closest to Sacred Power, but it is like, it's so meaty. Like there's kind of a smoky beef jerky note on the nose and then that really like savory yogurt, like black pepper yogurt note. Mm. That's a, I feel like that would go with the, sum, the summer stone. This is pretty, I feel like that's a good pairing. It's not quite as funky as the Crane of Paradise. Yeah. I got this, um, it's not a negative. I just don't know how else to describe it. But at the end of that pairing, it tastes a little steely. Not a negative. I just don't know. It, it does something and the finish for me. Well, I think it's that iodine quality in the oyster. Mm. So it, ha it has that like smoky brine that I think could come out as a little steely. It's not like the metallic quality that you get from having certain wines with oysters. Right. But, um, but yeah, there is an interesting sharpness. So I'm going to think about my pairing. There's a question, as a lover of all sake, but novice when it comes to oysters, which type of oyster would you recommend for a first time experience? open to all the flavor profiles that were discussed today. Amazing. So if you are shucking the oysters yourself, which you are now, um, I think actually uh, finding a easy to shuck oyster is definitely your best bet. It'll just make it so much less frustrating when you do it. And for easy to shuck oysters, I think the ROC reserves is a good option. If you find um, Bolsiles from New Brunswick, Canada, those are consistently easy to shuck. It takes freaking forever for them to grow up in New Brunswick, at least like four to five, if not six years. So the shells are very, very sturdy, um, very consistent as well. Um, and then other fairly clean, straightforward oysters, um, any deep tumbled oysters. So if you look at a Chelsea Gem or a Shigoku, uh, or a blue pool from Hama Hama. These oysters are the tumble. The tumble term means that they are constantly shuffled around, whether it's by hand, by machine, or by the tides throughout their life. So that instead of the oyster growing like out, like all these Pacifics that we have, they chip the out, outer edge of the shell and they grow this very, very deep cup. And in some cases, the cups are so deep that you kind of mistake them as like just rocks or golf balls in a sense. But I think those meats are just very, um, they're just very succulent and they're toothsome. And I think they make, especially if you like texture, I think it makes the oyster experience really enjoyable. And again, easy to shoot. Very thoughtful response. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go with the Katama. Okay. I cheated and I tried a couple, but I think <laughs> I think this is a really different approach. Uh, even though these are probably the two highest umami oysters, mm. I think that it really changes from how the pairing was with the summer stones. It, it definitely the summer stones seems to be more umami rich, where I thought it was the other way around mm. um, initially. Like I feel like that it brings out the salinity in the katama more. Um, and I, I just like the texture. The texture of the oyster seems really firm and just like ni just pleasant to chew on in your mouth. Yeah, I quite like that. Again, no wrong, no wrong pairing. It's like yeah. only just like a spectrum. Do I like it or do I like really, really like it? I really like that. I feel like that's it brings more of the floral notes of that oyster forward um, and then kind of lowers the funkiness or, you know, I guess umami almost has like two sides in that point, right? Like you have this really good savory side, but if you're not familiar with that profile, then it could taste like very, they're funky, like borderline fishy. But for me, the sake brings out just this vibrance and, and 
cleanness to the oyster. Yeah, same. I thought it really quieted down the more intense umami in this one. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks so much to everyone who's hanging out with us. Hopefully this has made you excited about pairing oysters and sake and made you feel like it's something that you could do in your own home. Um, there are, so we just wanted to give a shout out to some amazing establishments around the country who do offer this lineup of sakes. And um, if you, hopefully you guys are all gonna check out Julie's website after this in a half shell. Um, she, do you wanna talk about your shop link? Yeah, if you, so another place to get, yeah, the oysters delivered to home is on my site. It's either, you can just go to inahalfshell.com and then click on shop, or the short link is oyster.guru slash shop. And that'll take you to that database that I was talking about. Um, and we have another question from Mr. Mike Sesney about, are namazake too intense for good oyster pairings or are there some oysters that stand up? Namazake is amazing with oyster pairings and Julie and I actually met up in a socially distant way on Sunday to exchange oysters and sake. And um, we opened a bottle of Taka Namazake, which just like tastes like summer with the volume turned all the way up. There's so much like juicy watermelon and salted umeboshi plum and cucumber. And that was a great oyster pairing. So I think, um, you know, I, I, I the only, I would say that heavily aged sakes can be hard to pair with oysters, but even I've had some amazing nigori pairings. My boyfriend and I were in Hiroshima in December and we visited a brewery that makes a really intense nigori and we had that with um, with stewed oysters and that was phenomenal. But I think mm -hmm. that texturally you can have some a lot of fun. And, um, and like Julie said, it's really hard to have a wrong answer. Like these all are going to be good together mm -hmm. and I think the approach to oysters, you know, they arrived here, they're still a living thing, and namazakes are still a living thing. You know, there's so much microbiology happening both on the oyster side and the sake side that it they should be consumed together as close to the source as possible. So I think it's a great idea. Yeah, you're here. Um, well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Oh, Another question. Are there any, well, this is actually good. I'm actually curious about this. Are there any yes. Gulf oysters that you've experienced that blew your mind? <gasps> yes. This sounds like oh. something in Texas. Yes. Thank you for asking that. That's a great question. Yes, there have been many. Um, there has been a renaissance and happening in the Gulf with oyster culture. Uh, it's, it's, it's a shame that we can't get more of them in the Northeast. I mean, it's kind of like our loss, but right now um, my first boutique golf experience was with Murder Point, which is quite a name, I know, but they are like a really manicured, petite golf oyster that has moderate salinity, a ton of umami, great story behind it. They're like former shrimp farmers who wanted to diversify and they found oyster farming to be their calling essentially. And uh, yeah, their products blow my mind. Um, very, very buttery and creamy. So they take on some of the creamy characteristics, not to the extent like Pacifics, but in, in that same, same style. Um, and they're just surprisingly good. I've, I think I did like a couple events in New York where I was able to bring a few, several dozen up and people who never had a Gulf Oyster or who thought that only Gulf Oysters are like big and bland were blown away. Um, other Gulf oysters I've had that were amazing are, I guess there's just so many, like Pona Pines are really nice. Uh, Pelicans, which are from Florida by this really fun character in Canaan. Those are great. There's a great organization called Oyster South. You should look them up, but it's an organization that is of industry members, chefs, um, academics, conservationists who are all trying to support the development of Gulf oyster culture. So definitely, like I'm a member, definitely if you want to look at more varieties, you should go there. And then I guess I shouldn't leave out the Southern Atlantic states too, because there's freaking phenomenal oysters coming out from North Carolina and South Carolina that we also don't really get access to here, but some of them do ship direct. So they're on my list. 
That's really great to hear. I always, I have to admit, I did not know that there were such good Gulf oysters because I feel like, and you've told me this a lot, that it's so much of it is about marketing where there are so many areas of the world that have great oysters, but they send them somewhere more sexy to be finished because that place <laughs> is more famous for oysters. So that's good to know. Um, what about the Apalachicola area? Oh gosh, those are, you know, like one of the OG oyster Appalachians, right? The wild cultivated Appalachicolas from Florida. Um, sadly, mm, they're hard to find nowadays. I think the industry has really kind of been, I mean, they've just been challenged in a, a number of ways. So unfortunately, I've actually never had an Apalachicola because I haven't come across one and the wild harvesters have found themselves in just a predicament. There's like just less oysters and there's less of a market really to, or like a less of a viable market to get, you know, what they deserve. Um, I just from people talking about them, they're amazing and just cut a really beautiful confluence of the right conditions that make that oyster. Um, but yeah, I think if, you know, if you can find a true Apalachicola, which means that you probably have to go down there to experience it. And even so you have to find the harvester who claims that they harvested it from Apalachicola to try it. But I think, I, I think the bigger picture is that the oyster industry has changed and is changing and oyster farmers who are able to be stewards of that oyster from the beginning to the end are really going to be the future of the industry. And I'm very happy to support them. I think we should go to Apalachicola. <laughs> For sure. There's a, there's a couple actually really good events that the uh, Oyster South organization holds. Um, one of them was somewhat close to Apalachicola. It was like a, a symposium of sorts in Orange Beach. And there's like a really good oyster bar there too. But you know, it's, yeah, it, we will see. Like if maybe sometimes the wild heart, like fishery will come back and you can find Apalachicolas again uh, in, in greater abundance. Or um, I don't know, there's always a new oyster to discover. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for tonight. This was so much fun. Um, I, I learned a lot and I'm just, it's so exciting to see how many different permutations there are with just these five oysters and these four sakes. And so the journey kind of never stops. Um, thank you so much guys for joining us. We are lucky enough to do this all the time and we'd love to share more oysters and sake with you. So please reach out if we can ever be of service and uh, have a great night, come by. Thank you, Monica and Jen and everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs>